Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Pangolin Advisor and this is the first video of a series since I have been asked to cast a few selected replays from Bunny Queen's Warhammer 2 tournament and I will do just that with great happiness and joy. So let us begin by showing you the rules of this tournament and they are fairly simplistic. Best of three with no time limit and large font of the usual stuff you would see in a tournament setting with one a little bit unusual thing that being the fact that players are not allowed to bring in any artillery with the exception of artillery mounts for their lords. Haven't seen that one too often but it's not exactly unheard of either. So with, those, with that in mind, now that you know what you're getting yourself into, Let's start with the best of three for this video, and it's in the round of 16, so the very first round the players have to go through. And it's a fight between Twitchy Agony and Sunrise, so without further ado, let's get loading. As we load into the game, you can see that Agony Twitchy, sorry for mispronouncing your name before, is leading the Hell Elves while Sunrise is leading the Empire. And one thing that stands out to me right off the bat is that the Empire did not bring any wizards into the fray, making it impossible for them to use Hold in a second. To use the Winds of Magic, not to use the Hold in a second. That's a different thing entirely. I had to pause the game because I aim to introduce you to the armies of both players before we start. And I was planning to do this as slow motion, but I see some Vanguard action that might get real hot real fast as I see a bunch of hand gunners aiming at the poor poor Heralds of the Wind. So, Heralds of the Wind are Illyrian Reavers except the Regiment of Renown for Illyrian Reavers. And they're the same as Illyrian Reavers with a little bit more melee damage and way better melee stats, making those units actually capable of being a an emergency use shock cavalry of sorts. So that's kind of interesting and quite good on this map since it might be sometimes fairly important to pinpoint some of the Empire's armies, depending on what the, the Empire brings. So good idea to bring those guys into the fray. Next up we've got two units that are on the front of uh, the High Elves army, the Keepers of the Flame and the Scions of Mathwan, which are Regiment of Renown Spearmen and Regiment of Renown Phoenix Guard. Both are very powerful and very difficult to get rid of, providing nearby allies with bonuses to uh, st defending against the enemy. So very good idea to bring those on a map like this when things are going to get real clustered real fast. And they are followed by two units of Sisters of Avalon, very good armor piercing archers right there with magical damage, so no armor is going to be able to hold, out, uh, hold on to against those guys, gals rather, sorry. And finally, three stacks of Wild Lines of Chars, which get bonuses to their defensive stats as long as they are above 50% HP. Also, armor piercing, very good units to bring into a fight like this, quite elite. And finally, and I like this a whole ton, it looks like the High Elves decided to bring in two units of Spearmen to guard the back of the High Elves formation. A very good idea on a map like this that only where you can only be attacked from the back, from the sides and from the front. This makes it almost impossible for the Empire to have any successful flanking attempts against the High Elves. And finally, of course, we've got the Dragon Princess, very, very powerful elite shock cavalry going to do a number on the Empire cavalry should it show up. Finally, Alaria the Radiant looks like she brought in the Elf Blood spell as well as fast protection, so fair, some fairly typical spells on her. I'm going to be the de dedicated healer uh, buffer unit of sorts. And meanwhile, let's look at the Empire itself. So the Empire starts with three units of hand gunners at the front. Those guys are armor piercing, so they're going to do quite well against Wild Lions and the like. I'm not too keen on them being used on a map like this because it's a flat terrain between two hills. Those guys will be abstracted as soon as the melee fight starts since they cannot fire over the heads of the allied units. So for that job the uh, crossbowmen would be far better in my opinion and I would rather see them being used than the hand gunners. Next up we've got three units of halberdiers, very bold and a little bit of, mecha of meta pick against the high elves as the halberdiers do not have any shields and typically you see a lot of archers from the High Elves, so these guys are very vulnerable to archer fire, they only have 30 armor and no shields again, so those Sisters of Avalon can just tear through them, but I doubt the Sisters will target the Halberdiers, they are more important targets for the Sisters of Avalon to fire at. 
Finally, we've got three units of uh, the Flagellants. They never break, meaning uh, that they can stay in prolonged melee combat for a long time. But, oh, look at those shots from the Sisters of Avalon. But the problem with Flagellants is that they have no melee de defense as well as they no armor, making them very vulnerable to enemy attacks. But since they are on a territory line of attack, they should do quite well at dealing good amount of damage to the high elves. Finally, we've got one more unit of spearmen forgotten in the back, and Car of France. Car of France is very, very competitive and powerful duelist, often picked a legendary lord for melee combat. And finally, two units of outriders without blasting uh, or explosive ammo, whatever it's called, grenades, I believe that's what it was, my bad on forgetting the actual name, they still have good ammo piercing missiles, so they will do fine against enemy heavily ammo targets, and they are fast, so they can circle around the enemy uh, flanks and try to do damage where the hells do not expect it. And finally, three units of Reichsguard. Now, of course, Reichsguard are no match to Dragon Riders, but there uh, are three of them. They are cost efficient, they have good armor with bronze shielding, allowing them to ignore some of the enemy's uh, firepower. Good uh, choice to bring into this match, and they should do quite well uh, tearing through the enemy formation. So let's see what happens exactly, shall we? First up, opening volleys from the Sisters of Avalon. Very, very powerful and very, very scary. Just tearing through the enemy handgunners that are trying to return fire. But so far, it seems like they were not all that effective. I don't see all that much damage done to the enemy. Although Keepers of the Flame actually did take quite a bit of damage themselves already. I can see that the Wild Lions are actually pushing ahead. It looks like they are going to be the ones to take the brunt of the enemy's attack. Meanwhile, it looks like the Outriders are trying to get a cheeky little high ground position to fire at the enemy, but it looks like they have a hard time firing. They did fire a bunch, and now they disengage. It looks like they're going to attack from the side. Maybe I would have rather seen them use attacking from the back, but uh, this could also work at helping the Empire win the frontline engagement, which will be very difficult with the Sisters of Avalon providing support fire. They are just tearing through the enemy forces like there is no tomorrow, but the Reichsguard are in place, and this real charge can be very effective if they just thin the needle and go between the spearmen and around them as well and just silence the Sisters of Avalon, which clearly need to be silenced, they are dealing way too much damage already as it is. Dragon Princess can have be used to respond, and they are being used to respond indeed, and those Reichsguard are gone, they have no chance against the elite Dragon Riders. Where are the other, oh no this is tragic, the other Reichsguard are being caught by the spearmen, very unfortunate, they should disengage to try to fight the Sisters of Avalon ASAP. The Sisters have to be silenced, they are the main unit for uh, the High Elves. Meanwhile, the Empire is losing uh, a little bit of the front, but at the same time, uh, yeah, the Halberdiers, they are just uh, cr uh, crashing, they are wavering, they are about to run most likely, they are clear out much. However, the Flagellants joined the fight and the standing ground has been popped letting them stay in the fight for a little bit longer, doing some damage. And over here, Flagellants are trying not to die to the Keepers of the Flame with the support of the Outriders, which is actually killing quite a few of the Keepers of the Flame, but uh, I would rather see the Outriders used somewhere else. As you can see, the Wild Lions managed to punch through the enemy defensive lines and started attacking the Hand Gunners, silencing them already. These Hand Gunners, they are firing at something, so at the very least they have firing angle. Looks like the left flank is being dominated by the cows, while the right one is at the risk of collapse, and those hand gunners need to get out of their ACP. And the sisters of Avalon are still firing uncontested by the Reichsguard. Reichsguard is trying to get through to them, but the Dragon Princess, they're just all over the place. It looks like Twitchy, Agony Twitchy is doing a good job at making sure that the Reichsguard cannot contest and silence the sisters of Avalon. That just fire at the end with impunity. Look at this damage. Okay, admittedly, firing at the Flagellants. Well, it's going to kill them very easily. Maybe this is not the top tier unit that you should uh, aim for. Maybe there are some better ones. Although, that being said, that's the last thing holding the Empire in place. And those Rags got, they shouldn't be standing here. Oh no, this is a devastating blow. They should have been charging at the sisters, or at least charging at the back of the enemy formation, which I think they did, which is what helped the Empire survive the engagement on this flank. But the middle flank, it's a mess. Uh, the enemy harbadiers and spearmen, they just can't get into the combat all that well. The Heroes of the Wind engage and pin down the enemy spearmen. Of course, spearmen are going to do alright in the engagement, but with the balance of power where it is, the Heroes might just have this game. Some of the Empire units are rallying, and Kyle France needs to go out there and try to do something about this whole affair, but he's just now entered the fray already, and while he's winning, it might be too little too late, and 
that's all she wrote for the Empire. Empire has been destroyed. Let us proceed to the game number two. Before, however, we move on to the next game, I'd like to show you the stats for the first one. So as you can see, or rather as we can see because I'm looking at this for the first time myself, yeah, the Sisters of Avalon with a lot of kills, 99 on this unit, a lot of kills right there. And the Keepers of the Flame, again, they are just having a few day with the Flagellants. Flagellants themselves, they're relatively cheap, so they did okay, but I'm not sure if I would bring them as a territory line myself. And again, the Halberdiers, they just could not hold the line, they could not kill anything. I am not sure if they were a worthwhile investment. I'd rather see Spearmen with shields against High Elves. Granted, of course, the enemy did have Sisters of Avalon that would still have a few deal with them, but they would have been a more cost-effective option against the High Elves, in my opinion. Maybe, again, the Crossbowmen instead of the Handgarners. The Rags Guard, they did some damage, but mm, they didn't quite do enough to pay for themselves again. But honestly, that was a very interesting army composition. I liked it quite a bit. It's just that the house they had a very impenetrable defensive line, and those wild lions they just uh, annihilated all who opposed them. That was brilliant. So very good composition over there. And Lario was kept in the back, did not do anything damage-wise, but her healing spells are good enough on their own. So let us now move on to the next fight. And it looks like this time around Sunrise is leading the Tomb Kings while Agony Twitchy is leading the exact same army. That's somewhat unusual, but the tournament rules do not forbid this particular uh, army being used twice, so I suppose it is alright. So let's analyze those armies real quick, real fast. So it looks like we have the exact same deployment and units from the house as we did before. Except the Dragon Riders, the Princess, it looks like they are hidden inside those trees. So it's always good to have a few tricks up your sleeve and not to reveal all of your cards to the enemy. Then again, it's the exact same army, so I bet that Sunrise realized what he's up against immediately and should expect the Dragon Princess to be out there somewhere. Two Kings themselves, they brought in a few units of Skeleton Archers. Good idea, they're quite cost effective, have good range and uh, they often pay for themselves and get a lot of kills under their belts as well so very nice that uh, sunrise brought them in he also has two units of tomb, tomb guards of halberds they are nice although i would probably rather deploy one of them on each side of the formation to protect the archers since they're quite vulnerable to the enemy cavalry a unit of uh, tomb guards with swords and uh, i'm sorry three units of tomb guards with swords so uh, on each flanks and then three units of Skeleton Spearmen as well as High Queen Halira. Now she has very powerful abilities but again my reservation is the same as before. The Tomb Kings have no wizards so no way to use winds of magic and I do <clears throat> I'm sorry and I do uh, personally believe that you should always have somebody that can use winds of magic in a competitive environment. Lastly we've got two Hemrian War Sphinxes. War Sphinx I? I believe it's War Sphinx I. Uh, that are going to charge at the enemy and this is a little bit of a controversial decision honestly but let us not stay in the slow motion any longer and just start seeing why this decision is controversial it's controversial because the sisters of Avalon they love marrying the Hemrian Warsing Sai and this oh look at this damage it's massive and those guys are going to crash against the Sirens of Mafon as well as the Keepers of Flame which are not braced that's a mistake by uh, Twitchy Agony or Agony Twitchy, if they were braced, that meaning uh, that being caught, held in place, they would have gotten their charge defense against the Hemrian War Sphinx and they would not have taken as much damage. But look at this War Sphinx, it's being annihilated by the Archer Fire. He should not have engaged so early, instead, it should have been the Chaff, the Skeleton Spearman, weakening the enemy attack first and then the Hemrian War Sphinx eye charging afterwards. Next up, oh, this is a, again a very bad engagement for the Tomb Kings. The Dragon Princes are going to have a few days with the Tomb Guard. Meanwhile, however, the Skeleton Archers, they are firing uh, the House of Impunity and the Sisters of Avalon are taking a humongous amount of damage and have been immediately engaged by the Hemrian War Sphinx. So, the good on the Tomb Kings on silencing the Sisters of Avalon so quickly, but I'm really afraid that uh, their flank is going to like, collapse and that the Archers are going to be attacked real quickly, but a flanking attempt by the Tomb Kings, intercepted by the White Lionels of Charles, which is they're going to enjoy finding the Tomb Guard, but Tomb Guard also quite good against the White Lions, so who knows who's going to come up on top of in this engagement. One unit of Tomb Guards of Harbors is uh, moving through, 
They are not supposed to find infantry, but they will do okay against the Sisters of Avalon, so good idea to bring them in whenever possible. This Henry Wallswings needs to get out of there and do some cycle charging. He does not want to keep fighting this uh, Pierce, especially not the size of Muff one that can do quite well against the Henry Wallswings. Next up we see that uh, it looks like the Heralds of the Wind do exactly what they are meant to do and fight off the enemy skeleton archers, preventing them from being an effective unit they are. But they have been spread out a little bit and they continue to fire out the Heralds forces, but the balance of power is moving in the house favor and that's no surprise to me since uh, in melee in uh, direct melee combat they are doing quite well with the spearmen being crushed by the elite infantry of the high house and the uh, wide lines of chance doing very well against the tomb guards which uh, they are not spread well enough honestly to be very effective and now they're attacked by dragon princes so that's going to be a devastation right there for the tomb kings unfortunately the Ushapti have been spawned, however, and they are going to tear through a unit. I would much rather see them spawn over here on the Sisters of Avalon myself, however, to silence them again, because look at the damage to this Hammer Wall Sphinx. It's stable as for a moment, but now it's going to crumble again, and uh, this will be a massive, massive defeat. However, the Ushapti are doing quite well at finding the Wild Lions, but there we go, the Star of Avalon being triggered, and those Keepers of the Flame, they will just sit here forever, and the High Queen Kalida is a very good duelist with poison attacks as well, going to do quite well against the Keepers of the Flame, but there might just be too many units for the Tomb Kings to handle. There are still some Skeleton Archers online, but they'll probably be soon trampled by the Heralds of the Wind, who admittedly are not redoing really the trampling right now, but there's just no more, yeah, there are just, there's just no more meat on the ground for the Tomb Kings, and the High Elves they are just doing very good at protecting uh, the Sisters of Avalon, so quite impressive display over there by Agony Twitchy, preventing the enemy from outrunning and destroying the Sisters of Avalon. This one stack has been damaged quite badly in the fair, at the start of the engagement by the enemy archers and the Hemrion War Swings, but then everything stabilized and look at this, a total hold on all fronts. Of course the Wild Lions are losing against two stacks of Tomb Guards, but that's okay, they're keeping them occupied while the superior ranged forces of the High Elves are tearing through the Tomb Kings and that's all she wrote. So the victory goes to Agony Twitchy, a very very good display on him, impressive build and a very good execution right there as well. Look at the Tomb, uh, uh, the Dragon Riders and that's my card begging to let her out. Hold on Elsa, I'll deal with you in a second. So the Dragon Prince is doing quite well, I mean incredibly well, just tank through the enemy archers that did not pay for themselves in this example, although of course they did quite fun, quite okay dealing with the enemy sisters of Avalon, but because of the lack of protection they did not have the time to generate value. Again, one of those Toon Guards with Harbert should have protected them, and uh, the Toon Guards themselves they were doing far better, but they get a little bit too late. It should have been the Charm, the Skeletal Spearman, and the Tomb Guards rushing at the enemy position and only then allowing the Henry Warsings to attack, hopefully from the flanks, silencing the enemy archers once and for all. And then it should have been a game for the Tomb Kings, who actually had a very nicely balanced army. I would have preferred to see some kind of caster in there, maybe Setra the Imperishable, who is a very competitive one or maybe the black, who knows, uh, there are a bunch of options right there, but the White Lands of Charles again did very well, and uh, the Sons of Math 1 didn't get any kills, but they are the ones that stopped the Hammering Wall Swings in its track, so again, value was generated by them. Good game by both players, however, let's not make it sound like it was one-sided, but Agony Twitchy was just the better one in this case. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this spectacle. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this fight, I certainly did, and I hope that uh, you will continue to watch other fights from this tournament, I'm very eager to cast more of them, until next time then, it was Pangolin Advisor, thank you for watching, and I'll see you online.